All right, so for this lesson, you'll notice that I don't have the screen up, and that's just because I think I could do a better job of just explaining this one face-to-face -face, as opposed to trying to actually draw this one out because it's not something that really relies on uh, you know, flowcharts and stuff so much. Um, so I want to talk today about disk versus memory, right? Some people don't even know the difference. Um, a lot of just you know consumers and users out there they may not even know what the difference between having like uh, 16 gigabytes of ram versus 16 gigabytes of hard drive space or solid state drive space or just storage space you know it's, we used to call it hard drive space um or just drive space and now it's becoming um just like storage because um when people are becoming a little bit more familiar with memory meaning like ram and um you know hard drives are getting phased out now and we're, we're moving towards solid state and thumb drive so the, the terminology changed a little bit but basically what you do is you have uh you know uh volatile and non-volatile memory or um so volatile memory would be memory that um it doesn't as soon as you remove power from it like the memory is gone it's wiped it doesn't have any concept of you know, it doesn't, it doesn't remember what was on it last, right? Non-volatile memory doesn't have that issue. It can store, um, it can store bytes and data and stuff on it, even when the power is removed. Um, but we usually refer to like a hard drive or a solid state drive, or even, um, I guess like a CD you could say as well as, a disc, even though it's not necessarily a disc anymore. And that's just what we call it, right? And so the, there's going to be kind of an interesting, cool little plot twist here. And that is, is, is this has a direct relation to what you do as a programmer, because like what's happening when somebody like, let's say you distribute your program or your app and the user installs it. Well, what does that mean? Right? It means that they're placing it on their, uh, their disc you know, their uh, persistent storage. So it's going to be on there even when they shut their device off and reboot it and all that. Well, what happens when they run the program, though? Like when they double-click on it or they tap on it? Um, that's a little bit different. So what's going on then is um, the program, which is basically just a list of instructions. Now, it's not the list of instructions that you wrote as the programmer unless you wrote the instructions directly in assembly language um, because it went through a compiler and the compiler optimizes it and changes your code around and tries to fix your mistakes and make the thing quicker um, for the processor. And then after it does that, it outputs uh, a big, huge, long list, just like literally a linear list of instructions. It's like one gigantic, huge, long, like, word file, basically, <laughs> except for the computer, right? And what the computer then does is, um, so when someone double clicks it and, or opens up the, the app, it takes, it, it runs it through a program, another program, which is part of the operating system, and it's called the loader. And what the loader does is it goes through the instructions, which are on the disk at this point, which is your program, like your app that the person downloaded and installed and stuff. And it goes through those instructions and it says, okay, like, uh, what do I need to move from the disk into active, like, what's actually going to be used here? And the majority of the, the program will get will be used. So it's going to take and load the instructions for the program from the disk into RAM, into memory, right? So now, like, so the reason why that needs to happen is because the processor deals directly with RAM. It deals with other things too. It has registers inside of it, which it also handles, which are super fast because they're actually part of the CPU. Then it has these other things between it and RAM called caches. I'm sure you've heard of like the L2, L3 cache and all that kind of stuff, right? But anyway, eventually it does deal directly with the RAM. I mean, it has signals and stuff. It just sends directly to it from the RAM. And um, it's much faster to deal directly with the RAM than it is to deal with a drive. So that's why when a when a program is opened or executed, it gets loaded into RAM because this allows it to operate 
in a timely manner and not be like super slow and lagging and stuff like that. Um, so that's one of the main reasons for that. So what happens is when the person launches your application, it gets loaded into RAM. Um, and the loader is the thing that does that. And what it does, is it goes down through the application instructions real quick and it, and it figures out, um, how to load it into RAM, where to put it in RAM, um, how much RAM it needs for every single different section of all of the different, uh, you know, code areas. Cause you have to remember that when you write a program and you compile it down, um, there's a lot more instructions to the computer than what you see because um, the compiler adds extra instructions in there and um, those all get placed and linked into the main file as well. And you don't really see that usually unless you purposely look for it using a disassembler or a debugger or something like that. So your code is just part of this program. Even though you wrote the main code, and if it's a big application, your code will be the majority of the program, it's still only part of the program. There's still, um, there's other sections which are like, which are, um, are used to set up the memory and set up the entire uh, structure for your application to be able to run properly, okay? So remember that, that's a real important concept. So, all of that stuff gets put through the loader. The loader figures out, okay, what do I need to put into memory right now? It's usually the majority of the program, but there's some things that don't need to be put into memory at all. Like for example, if it's the debug, uh, if it's the debug build or whatever, and like the debug information doesn't need to be loaded in. And so it is placed at the end of the file. And there's sometimes other things, you know, that don't need to be loaded in as well. And they're also not loaded. So it just loads in whatever it needs to run the program. So now the program is in memory. It's in RAM. So at this point, that's when you can like go, you can, on a Windows system, you could, you know, hit control, shift, escape, or control, alt, delete. And you could see it appearing as a process and threads and all that kind of stuff. Because now it's loaded into memory. The program is running actively. Like that's what the term running really means i mean in it, it running means that it's loaded in memory and it's being the program is being executed right i mean even if you pause execution the program is still loaded in memory it's still an active program it's not like sitting on a disk you know deactivated or anything like that so i wanted to make that very clear because not everybody really learns that and um it's like kind of you know, bits and pieces of it everywhere. I know that's how it was for me, at least. So um, that's what happens when you run a program. When a user double clicks on the executable, you know, it gets loaded into memory. And then once it's in memory, that's when the processor starts to run down the, uh, like I said in the previous video, it has something called the instruction pointer or the IP. And the IP just goes, okay, let's do this instruction, that instruction, that instruction, that instruction. It just keeps, it's just going super fast and it's just flying through all these different instructions. And sometimes what will happen is the IP will hit a certain instruction and that instruction says, hey, go jump to some other area in memory. So instead of going to the next instruction, it just goes way down somewhere else and it, it, it finds the instruction that it was told to jump to. And what's cool about this is that that is really how a loop works. Like um, if you're a programmer, you know a for loop and a while loop and this and that. Well, actually, I'm not sure if you're familiar with uh, what a go-to statement is, but we're often discouraged from using them in high-level languages, um, which is like C and up, basically. But really, the processor, that's how it views a loop anyway. It basically just says, okay, um, you know, go here, check these two conditions, or check this condition, you know, if, if the left number is, is greater than the right number, then jump down to, or jump back up to the start of the loop and then do it again and then jump back up the start of the loop and then do it again and then every single time it's doing it it's incrementing by one or by whatever it's just like it's, it's literally a for loop or a while loop but the processor doesn't see it with the parentheses and the for and the while and all that stuff it just sees it as okay um execute this code these instructions like you know move this here add this subtract multiply and then boom is um the value in EAX greater than the value in EBX? If so, jump back up 
now increment and then do all the instructions again and then do the comparison and then if so jump back up that's all it is so it's actually sort of a linear process it's just following a, a linear thing even though we 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 think of it as a loop the computer doesn't really think of it that way so anyways um so yeah that's what's going on in the memory when a person starts the program i mean it's just loading the instructions into memory and then it's executing them and this is a important concept that i wanted to dedicate a separate video to and um, I hope that makes things a little bit more clear and sets us up for the future. Alright, until next time. Thank you.